All right, the goal for the, muse the meeting is to, like a State of the Union, you know, lay it all out for the membership. Because you are the guys that support the museum and allow us to do what we do. So that's why we put everybody up here. So if you have questions for the board now or later, they're all up here. Linda's got all the financials. We, if everyone grabbed one of each from that table, you also have what I'm looking at in front of me. So this is just a very short list of what we made at the Spring Bazaar, the income, the expense, our net. Uh, was 1,925.71 was the net for the Spring Bazaar. Outpost days, we grossed $36,494.74. As I heard, that was one of the best outpost days we've had in a very long time. So that's pretty good. We did have expenses, though, 12000 of it, so we grossed still 24492 that's still pretty good. Christmas Bazaar, uh, we grow, uh, our net income was 5423 So our fundraiser total this year was 31 grand. So what we fundraised, we paid out in um, maintenance, improvements, displays, new displays. So we're, we're still okay. We're, we're making and we're spending about the same amount. So it's still good. So I'm not spending too much. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't I don't listen to her. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about this? One way to get our net up, especially for outpost days, uh, Deb Lindner and I are the chair. We are the ones organizing. She's really the main chair, but I'm I'm right next to her. I'd like to see this kitchen. She's very picky. She wants everything, you know, it needs to be this, you know, pie's homemade. If you're going to donate a pie, homemade pie. That's what we're known for. If you donate a Costco pie, it's not going to be put out until we are desperate. Because why put out a Costco pie when we're homemade? But anyways, if you guys would like, or spread the word, from now until outpost days, bottles of water, cans of soda, things that we can stockpile until outpost days, we don't have, that means we don't have to pay to go buy this stuff. It should be donated as much as possible. So food items are hard. Sour cream, ketchup, that thing kind of can go bad. But bottles of, yeah, bottles of water, water bottles, sodas, beer. You want to donate, you know, cans of beer for the saloon. It can all be a great help and that will make our net higher, which means I can spend more for displays and things. So we want more money. So you can, you know, help out by volunteering, especially all these projects. That's why everyone's going to go home with this project form and this is the plan hopefully for this year slash next year and if you can help by labor let me know sometimes it's better for just give me the check and I can go buy whatever it needs to be done like I need gutters give me the check and I can go buy exactly what we need for the gutters or downspouts or you know specifically otherwise you know we're gonna get things donated that thanks but it's not going to match or it won't work. So sometimes monetary is the best way um, to help uh, at times. So uh, first thing before we get started in the 2020, 2019, this is everything I could remember top of my head is a list starting from trying to start when I started in November of 2018 is when I started. So tractor restoration, lighting upgrade the museums two and three, that is the bit and spur room and the mine tunnel now room one two three as you come in through the museum started the 1915 model t and continue the maintenance on it and operations constructed the mine tunnel put in the ore cart displays are new including swan falls power line baltimore no boise nap and Hawaii railroad display oregon trail display medical display rifle display updated and moved other displays and right now the Silver City display is the mural is being worked on. Railroad speeder that has been sitting here since 1975 was purchased by Dan Yonke and restored. We made money on that but we still somewhat have the speeder. We can have it brought back to the museum. Channel 7 News came out, did a special on TV on the light bulb that we found. Fire extinguishers were updated. Some of them dated to 1997. <laughs> We're a little outdated. So all fire extinguishers are updated. Not choir, the 1920 player piano. Updated the park lights outside here with LED lights inside them. Joined the Idaho Gives. That's right. Coming up, I believe, May 7th this year is the big Idaho Gives. And we are a part of that. So we're going to start marketing that again on Facebook. Uh, started the Hawaii Trails video. 
which is on our YouTube and Facebook page where the director goes around the county and sticks a microphone in your face and goes, hi! Hi, hi, yeah, what's, what's cool here? Yeah, what, what's unique about your town? Hawaii Trails hosted the Homedale School Field Trip in April, hooked up the power to the stamp mill and fixed the water hydrant at the stamp mill area. Min uh, main museum roof was fixed uh, and fixed in air quotations, including all flashing gutters downspouts. They are band-aid fixes. Steve is currently still watching those, and we will continue to monitor those uh, improvements on the roof. But we did save a lot of money by having Steve do the work instead of hiring the contractor out to seal the roof. Um, created the native plant display, plant plant garden in the back. We added some yucca back there just recently. A uh, brand new camera system is now in the entire building and it has fixed the blind spots. So if anyone would like to look at the American flag, there's a little dot way in the camera. There you go. That's our camera. I can see everything from my office now. I caught Vivian one night coming in sneaking candy out of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> caught her red hand. Uh, she's going to kick me in the upgrade kitchen. Uh, the kitchen is now fully upgraded with new ca cabinets. All by De Deborah did all that last year. The cabinets, two new microwaves. Most of all the improvements you see in there over a year were, was uh, fundraised by Deb. So we, the museum did not have to pay much of that um, upgrading. So we are now a full-fledged kitchen in there. We acquired a 1924 it's in tractor. We identified all the rock and mineral samples in the ore cabinet, the Dewey ore cabinet, and that was done by the Idaho Mining and Geology Museum. We hosted the museum's 50th celebration of outpost days. We cleaned and washed and painted the floor in the annex, moved displays back in, in a logical order of how farm equipment was used. We, uh, we, we purchased a new refrigerator for sodas in the, in the gift shop, as the old one had totally fried. Um, we, um, we joined the Harvest Hosts group for campers, joined TripAdvisor. We installed a new point of sale system in the gift shop. We are now fully updated with the modern technology from a chip reading to your Apple Pay, all of that on a square, and that was donated by Mary O'Malley, the full sum and then sum for that. So when you see her next, make sure you thank her. We moved the sheep herders wagon so we could put, we could work on it and also have museum space for our new exhibits coming up. We reestablished museum status with the federal government accounts, the SAM account. That was fun, I don't want to do it again. Um, working with the government is not the greatest online. We installed HVAC system, we got gravel for the annex area, the drainage, and started organizing and cleaning the library as we ended 2019. So, any questions on that? We're all happy? I hope so. All right, one thing when cleaning out my office and my drawer, I found this document. I read it and it made me laugh because everything that in this document, I've already A, done or will do before I even read this. And the document is a cultural assessment program for the Hawaii County Historical Society done by the Architectural Assessment Arrow Rock Architects PLLC, August 20th, 2014. And what they list in here is everything A, I've, we've already done or we will start. And you'll see some of that on here. And the first thing we start with is our schoolhouse. So we're going to go around the complex and come inside here. So our schoolhouse is a first order of business is evaluate a stucco trim, evaluate the roof eaves and the bell tower, make sure everything is secure up there. As you can see, paint, it needs paint, it needs a lot of stuff. The roof is in good shape, but underneath the eaves are starting to um, kind of rot and weather. Uh, schoolhouse needs quite a bit, especially the stucco. Um, so this, this is just evaluating. We're not doing anything right now. We're going to possibly, we're just going to look at it and go, yeah, that's going to cost, that's going to do this, so got to evaluate all of that. As you can see, a lot of chipping, water is going to get underneath here. That's not, not, not good. What, the, um, what that was written up in the architectural survey, which is correct, the history here I'll read to you. Um, the Murphy Schoolhouse was constructed in 1900 and located on Delamar Avenue, a few blocks north of near Rabbit Creek. It was moved to its a present location near the courthouse in 1935 and placed upon a poured concrete foundation. It continued to serve as a school until 1963, after which children were transported to Melba 
25 miles away. The school district then transferred the title to the Hawaii County Store Society. The schoolhouse served as a museum until 73, and the building was, uh, uh, when it was constructed to the south of the, the building. The wood frame building was original, so underneath that stucco is the original wood um, siding. Clad in lap siding with uh, corner boards, in about 1958 the exterior was stuccoed. Uh, according to the history I just found, was it was stuccoed because the whole building shook when it when it was the wind was blowing. <laughs> so they stuck it up, saying, "Well, that'll prevent that'll be heated and will also reinforce it." So possibly the plan to remove the entire stucco and restore it back to wood is probably not going to happen because if, because that would be a big job. I talked to Idaho Heritage Trust, uh, Catherine, the, the, top, the lady there, she suggests probably removing the bottom corner here all the way around and, that, and then maybe just restuckling the, where it's cracked on the bottom and patch anything up here because this area is in good shape and this is in bad shape. So maybe a five foot line all the way around the building and remove and redo. And that's, but that probably won't happen until not, not this year, maybe next year. That's a, at least right now. So this is what they evaluated. Um, this is on my sheet here. As you can see, you know, patch is missing. This is the old wood frame window. This is actually currently, this one's gone. He's taken that out. He's going to fix all of that around the window, the window frame. All that's going to get fixed. So um, at this point, we are have to worry about now the stucco on um, the outside. Also, you know, these are things, I mean, this is everything that they point out. Schoolhouse, it's not ADA accessible right now. Um, it's on the, you know, Murphy Schoolhouse is not listed on the National Register of Historic Places. In their opinion, it would be a good candidate for listing, so that's possibly we could do that. Moving inside, the, everything, like I said, it's all... <laughs> We're planning to remove in the next week, or at least starting next week, all the displays in the lobby and put them away for safekeeping because we will use them again probably. Because we are going to remove the entire lobby, all this wall, this wall, all of this is going away. They're not original to the, to the building. Uh, they were added, bathrooms were added in the lobby, the vestibule here. Uh, originally you had, a, you had an outhouse, the kids went outside. In the 30s or the 40s or whenever, maybe in the 50s, they added the two bathrooms here, put the plumbing in, they put a, two uh, septic tanks we just found and pumped. They were full. Um, so that's going to start the project. These courtroom doors were from the courtroom. They're not from the schoolhouse. They're going to be stored away for safekeeping. But open all of this up. They're, the reason we're doing it right away in January here is because this window sits, this wall sits right in the middle of the window and that's going to have to come, come out and to easily to get to that from the inside outside is to remove that wall. So we're going to start the project here uh, next week with removing the artifacts. Then I told Steve let's start in, Jan in February with tearing out the walls in here and uh, the plumbing in here. Cap the plumbing. We don't need toilet plugs anymore going into those tanks in here. Also removal of the sink the sink and all that, that'll all come out. That side, this whole wall, you can see it's just temporary wall they put in. Behind it is... Go the wrong way. The, behind it is... Um, there's the sealed up window. And really it looks like a coat room. I mean, you would have walked in, you could have had a coat room, your backpacks and things like that. And also... They have backpacks back there. <laughs> Coat room, um, and uh, possibly at one time the vestibule was used to teach another grade of class. They said, and I found the history, so possibly. So we're going to open all this up, the floor, in the design here, this plan. They said, take the floor back, take the paint off, refurbish the floor. Uh, they really get into detail to the point of the way the wainscoting is painted. Should not be painted. Maybe you should strip it. Maybe you should paint it to a coating of a stain if you don't want to strip it. So they're really detailed in here and we can, we can play with that a little bit. Moving into the actual schoolhouse, the first thing before uh, possibly outpost days, all the fluorescent lighting and the non-working electric heaters will be removed. 
The fluorescents were added when the museum walked in. The electric heat was added as well. All the conduit, all the heating and electrical will come out and go back to the one or two lamp sockets in the ceiling. And then the, the wiring will be identified, um, scoped out, make sure it's safe, if not rewired. And then put in, one day, put in six, three on each side, schoolhouse milk glass. Ooh. Chandelier globes. Was it ever in there? Probably not, but it fits and we have extra lighting because really like there is clear light bulbs, one there, one there, one there, one there. They're just sockets in the ceiling. We can restore that so we can say this is what it was. You need more light, we've got these. So, But get rid of the ugly fluorescent and these electric heaters don't work. There's a bank of switches in the lobby, get rid of all of those because all the switches would really pertain to the heaters. So we're going to start cleaning that up and taking it back to original. <clears throat> Main room, as you can see, um, I'd like to put in um, curtains, lace, maybe old looking curtains. They probably never would have had curtains in there because they needed the light as much as possible to come into the room. But I need to keep the UV out. That's tearing up, <coughs> as you can imagine, that's just all the time tearing that up in there. So we'd like to um, put in something to cut that light. And then during outpost days or during events, we can always take the curtains and move them away to show, you know, to, to move all that out. <clears throat> Other than that, what's in here is good. There is a little stove in here, which we're not going to use as a chimney that we could use. We're going to evaluate the chimney this summer. Uh, one thing that the window guy said, the reason you have the, what you have in here for windows are warping, the wood is icky, you've got a climate issue. You have extreme cold, extreme hot. There is nothing in this building that's regulating the climate at all. So his suggestion was put a small pellet stove in there. Regulates it all the time, you're done, and at least it keeps it at a steady 50 degrees. And he would, he'd be happy with that. And I said, well, okay, let's evaluate the chimney then this summer, see if we can plug into it at least. Um, that's going to be something that the board and, and, and the membership can, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm really happy with putting, even if I, pellet stoves are great, I, we have one at home, but it's fire. It's fire in an old building. <laughs> I don't know if I want that. You know, electric furnace, it, there's things that can always go wrong, but no one's ever in there watching this stuff. So, but he had, we have an issue with temperature. Of course, the windows are, you're never going to keep it hot. So we are getting that fixed. But so this room, and the last thing in the main room is the uh, uh, 2021 possibly empty the entire building of all artifacts, store them properly, and refinish the entire floor. Sand it, buff it, stain it, and put it back to, and it, need, it needs it. It's been a long, long time. A lot of scratch on that original wood floor. So that's for the schoolhouse. We got stucco, we've got paint, windows are getting it right now, and then the vestibule is gonna get totally, so by outpost days, you won't recognize the lobby of the schoolhouse. So and the lighting hopefully will be removed, or sometime this summer, we'll get that done. So. Any questions on that? Yes. Oh, you were speaking about refinishing that floor, which in some ways I agree, and others, is it really needed, or would it be kind of nice to see what, leaving what it was left as a school? That's the last order of business in that room, would be the floor. It's so far, right now, it's remove artifacts, refinish floor, I put 2021. That, on my list, that's very low to do. So just, you know, to think of it. It looks good, and it's yeah. not like it, but to protect it, it probably would be good to refinish it. Yeah, well, and, I think all the wounds, so to speak, would be... Yeah. yeah. The only thing I would do would be the, the lobby. It was painted gray. Mm -hmm. That's not original. Yeah. You could clean that up, sand it, and varnish it. I mean, that's... Right here, that's what they say. Exactly what I'm considering is take it back to the, the 1930s at least in time period. So that's the tough part when you're doing restoration. What time period? Do you want to take it back to 1900? Because that means you're moving everything, all the stucco, you know, li electric lighting probably too. So the floor, yeah, like that's the very bottom of the list. I think the, the question I'm understanding is. You want to kind of keep it authentic too, so you you can still restore it and keep the authentic look to it. Also, mm -hmm. I mean, there are ways of keeping the 
The only part of refinishing was to protect. <clears throat> yeah. Protect so you can, you can still keep the love of the stars in there. And, and still. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to sand it down real deep. Yeah. Keep, yeah, keep Jimmy's name inscribed in it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving outside to the tool yard. It's completely empty. If you hadn't noticed, it's dark, I know, tonight. But it's totally empty. All the artifacts we had in there are either in the annex or have been sold to happy homeowners that have yard art now, because we have duplicates. We, it was too far gone to be put in the annex. So it's wide open now. The goal would be is to put another gate, and I possibly have someone that might donate the money for the gate, so that way we can drive all the way from this side to the other side, drive through for outpost days or events for outpost days, have it totally open, so people can walk all around in there instead of being you'll have to come in from one way only. We're going to keep the fence because it protects the cabin, it protects anything we do store in the uh, tool yard. The cabin needs work, especially the beam. The inside is okay, there's, there's parts of the wall that are needing new chinking and things like that. It needs to be cleaned up in there a little bit too before outpost days. But the main concern is the, the beam. They just put a new roof on it in Amy's time. Unfortunately. The cottonwood beam has busted. I talked to Chad Nettleton to get a cottonwood beam or a log to fix this. And Mary, Mary O'Malley's kind of been heading, well, she's been helping me, guide me to the, they have specific dirt, so that way everything is kept as James, when he built the cabin, uh, accurate. So the, the wood, the dirt, <clears throat> we're losing our topsoil on the roof. You can start to see the visqueen that they put on top, which is an original, but at least they, they protect over the weather, so that beam broke. So we need to fix that sometime this summer as well. So that's on our project list. The uh, pole barn, we're gonna keep in that location because I'm afraid if we take it apart, we'll never get it back up again. Uh, it's, a, it's not attached to the schoolhouse. There is a gap, not very wide, but it, there's a gap. Right now we're storing our outhouse trailer in there to keep it dry. The goal I'd like to see would be this half is to turn this corner here into a permanent blacksmith shop. Stove, you know, anvil, we have anvils here, but when you know, build the stove and all that, that way the blacksmith comes in, sets up, and he can blacksmith all he wants. Bring your tools and you're, you're good to go. And that, even if it's just the one corner, we still have two stalls to pull in a, two trailers or something, because this is totally open now. There's a lot of room in there to either get other collection stuff in there, or but I like to see a blacksmith. It's, it's, it feels like a blacksmith shop when you walk in there, kind of set up already. So, um, if you know anybody that'd be willing to help with that project, let me know because I don't have a blacksmith lined up that can go. Yeah, I, you know, this here, that there, stuff like that. But. So uh, over to the. This is from that report, and they. This is what made me chuckle because. I read this, I think, right after we had the torrential downpour and the flood here, and they pointed out, divert water toward other area, because this whole area here, this is the back door of the museum over here, and the schoolhouse is right here. All the water from the depot and the caboose comes surging down, and the schoolhouse and the museum converges right here in our back door, and this is higher than that. So everything starts to pour in everywhere, and they, they said, you know, you need to figure that gravel out. And, and after that flood, it was like, yeah, we need to do something about that. Also, between that back door and the annex is all gravel or mud. Um, so we have, again, ADA compliant. We are not uh, out there. And if we're going to continue taking people out there, which we are, we need to think about the future of the handicap. And the future of that would be um, adding an asphalt pathway. So we're starting this year, which you'll see this area here has all been graded. And so all this water came off here and created a lake. All the water came off here and went all down to that back door. It was, a, it was huge. So we've created a, I'll get ahead of myself, but I'd like to put a gutter along the top of one side of the annex because that at least will stop the drips in front of this door. Possibly even a, lean, a little awning here out that would also help with drips and then this gutter would channel down into a pipe and the pipe would take it out to the alleyway here and that would and we don't have a lot of downpours in murphy but it's once a year or maybe twice we'll have a cloud burst and all hell breaks loose 
Otherwise, it's a slow melt of snow and drips. But uh, there was it was a really muddy mess here. So we graded all this out. We made a little divot right here. A berm has been made here. So now water is actually forced this way to the county and let them deal with it after. That's off my mind. <laughs> it goes into Tiffany's back door. It's not <laughs> well. <laughs> so, unfortunately, you're downhill. <laughs> So the plan is this year is to pour heavy-duty gravel all the way to that back door and up here. That'll solve the mud issue. Before we pour the gravel, we'd like to put a culvert pipe here and then a French drain here and then bricks here. So as the water comes down, hopefully the silt and junk goes into a, a hole. Then it'll go into this culvert pipe underneath our pathway because this down to here will be a level grade. Right now you kind of walk up and then through the dip and then up again. So. The gravel, at least by outpost days, you'll have this gravel here, the culvert in. You can still drive over it a little bit, and then in the future, 2021 or whenever, is then on top of that gravel is to pour a very simple asphalt pathway all the way to here. Now you can walk out there all year round, and you can push, you know, a wheelchair out there, things like that, and that at least gets people to the front door of our annex building. And then if the schoolhouse needs to be ADA, this would be the door to do it in. We'll have a ramp back here. Probably come right off this, you know, this is all way in the future, but these are possibilities to, you know, get to these other buildings here. But yeah, we had all of this with water all the way down to here. This was a mess. You can see the stain because the water was splashing here. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. Yeah, Rabbit Creek flow. Oh, it was immense. So, yeah. We were working in the annex that day. <laughs> mm -hmm. We got pictures of the creek flowing. That tells you how much water came down to mm -hmm. get the creek to flow. But that's the plan for the exterior drainage issue. The gutter will help prevent the lake from forming back here where this retaining wall is being built. Uh, and that gutter will channel it down over to another retaining wall that's going to hold back the alleyway dirt. And there will be a pipe that comes out with the concrete and it won't wash away the wall. And it will all then be channeled into this alley and out to the street when we have one of those downpipes. There's that wall we're creating, right? What they did is they, they put the annex in, they chewed away the dirt, they made it level and they walked away. So now we have issues with erosion here. We don't want the caboose to fall over. Uh, and also, you know, people climb up and down the dirt, which erodes it more. So we had donations of railroad, um, uh, not railroad ties, but they're very similar. And Steve's been building the wall here around back. And then we've also figured out the water issue from the street. All that water would go to the back door, the shop door of the annex. And now that's been channeled to go following the street more. So we're pushing the water away from us. And this one will be full of gravel as well. And uh, just, just an access way around here. Inside the annex, uh, first things are... Um, create a new wall uh, frame for an electrical panel and replace the current one that's up there. This is a temporary tack on job because they had to get the electrical panel in, they had to get the lights in, just put it up, we'll deal with it later. So here we are, hopefully this year uh, Steve can build us a new wall to the height of that corner, complete this wall over so there's not a gap here. This wall here will height all the way, one day, will height all the way around the entire comp building with electrical outlets and it'll be a real um, uh, wall you can hang things on and things like that. With this new wall in place, town and country will come out, install the one we build on the floor, put it up, take this one down, put that panel and make it flush with the wall and hide all this conduit behind and then we'll leave stick out here, and then that way we can continue piecing it over and over all the way around here, and we'll have a complete lobby area wall. Uh, we'd like to at least get this piece done this year, and <coughs> the goal way back was to install the furnace. It is sitting here right now. There's a, there's a heating duct that runs out here and ends, and there are vents and there's vents inside this storage unit here. The storage unit is open to the elements above. It's a, it's a loft. This is why heating just this was impossible unless you build this all the way up to the, all the way up and sealing it off. So I thought, well, the easiest way is to seal off the building on that I-beam and create a lobby. 
that will heat the lobby, and you could have all your display cases and all your artifacts would be great. And you put new Western lighting on a truss system, move this ugly light over to here and use it only for your upstairs light. So when you walk in, you flip a switch, Western lighting comes on, display cases walk through double door into the annex, and you got the annex, which will be not climate regulated. It's just ag equipment out there. That wall is 13 grand. Because that's going to include electrical, it's going to include installing the wall, which is 11 grand. So there was no way to fundraise in that. So we, we got enough for the heating, which is now heating the entire building. So this is kind of what it is right now. There's heat going everywhere. Because the wall is a lot of money, that is very far on the list. Maybe not at all. Because right now at least the whole building is warm. But I'd still like to build this truss. This is a, what I call a barn truss. And still hang the western lighting. And the, the truss system will then create us places to hang a lot, a lot of artifacts that are small buckets and pitchers and bicycles and a door from a service forest truck that we've got in there. Things that you just can't build a display around. We can hang them all up in the ceiling and the rafters like Cracker Barrel does. When you walk in the gift shop there, Cracker Barrel, and it's all hanging, it's an eclectic, and it's part of the exhibits then. And the only thing is we have to figure out how to secure these posts into the ground because this wall and this wall are securing these, tim uh, these trusses but these are going to be floating in a way out out there. We would leave room in case one day we wanted to put a wall in, we could still put that in, but in the meantime at least get these in, get the lights in, and illuminate it better, um, and it'll add, you walk in that building, you're going to see that. So that's quite, that would think be quite impressive, too. Of course, you can see that wall is completed here as well here. This is what I'm talking about right here. Um, what is that, a Wayne's coating? Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe copper tin, fake plastic <coughs> copper tin ceiling panels here. You know, very, very western rustic feel. But I'd like to see if we could get this installed. I'd like to see the posts be made out of local timber or pine. Even if it's straight wood. Give it that really a rustic bark feel, uh, not just you know stuff from Home Depot. So, but it's got to be straight and it's got to be able to hold the bearing of of that truss. So, um, uh, start evaluating that this year sometime. Also, evaluate is to clean out the storage room. Um, it's not bad, but there's a lot of stuff that got put in here from the depot. When we emptied the depot. We emptied it into here. Uh, so it's extra, there's a lot of stuff, but there's still room for a lot more stuff if we could just get it all cleaned out and organized. So now that it's heated, me and Margaret and everyone else, we can all start going out there and start organizing, cleaning, and getting, there's a staircase that goes up to that loft area up there where the furnace sits now. Um, and then displays, panels, um, more display panels so that, what is this? This is a plow. How is it used? Possibly with that new wall that will one day run across this building here without electrical outlets You could plug in a computer and it's virtual you tap the screen You know it's so your modern technology modern display where it shows a farmer pulling a plow or shows how this machine was operated for now Getting some type of a better display out there so that people can read on their own what each thing was But as you can see it's laid out plows to tilling to spreading the manure, to cutting the hay, to all the way in the back corner there is a big large threshing machine there, the clover hauler. So, and this half the building is permanent, non-movable displays. The middle of the building is movable, and the other half of the building is movable items. So for outpost days, the entire half of the building can be to completely emptied for vendors still. So we're keeping that um, open. The other thing in possibly the end of this year, early next year, because they're, they're not cheap, so this is where donations come in great, and I can buy what we need. These lights, we need four big spot, um, they call them UFO lights because that's what they're flat discs, but they're replacing the old um, uh, high intensity um, discharge lights that warehouses have, like Costco has big, those big lights up there. Now they're making them in flat, round discs, and they put up the same amount of uh, light. And we would hang them one, two, three, four. There would be a conduit line running to that door and the other door. So when you come in, you hit your lobby lights, you hit these lights, and these lights will stay on their motion sensor. So they'll come on when you're underneath them. Problem is, when they're on, 
all of this is dark, this is dark, there's not enough light, and you're working over here, and you don't move enough, light clicks off. <laughs> or you walk in the building with a group of people, oh, here, let me show you the annex, and I go run them away from them, and they're going, you know, they don't know what's going on, I'm going, turn the lights on. And I said, don't, just as you walk, they'll turn on. So we definitely need um, LED high, you know, big lights in here, and that will help the vendors, that'll help displays. The summertime, there's a lot of light. We open the doors, outpost days is fine, but in wintertime, it's dark in there. So, kind of looked for, um, top of my head, I think each light's going to cost us uh, 200 or more. Less than 500, more than 100 for each individual light. And then that's not installation. How are you going to, right now, we don't have a genie lift. Also, conduit lines, switches. So I order them, town and country comes out, electric, electric installs them. You're looking at a bill over $1,000 for just the installation, probably. Um, so th this is a plan for the end of the year, early next year, but eventually upgraded lighting in the annex. The caboose, far on the list, as you can see, 2022. It's just, I'm just putting it out there. We're doing the complex overview. Caboose restoration. I already did one, I don't want to do one soon, so <laughs> put them off. This one's easier, I would say, there's no hot riveting, it's welded. That doesn't make it any less, more money, and you're probably, I, the caboose we restore because it was a 1942-41 caboose, hot rivet, tongue, tongue and groove interior, wood. This one doesn't have that kind of stuff. The paint alone is going to cost you, but you're looking at a full, complete, thorough restoration from top to bottom with paint, $13,800. That's what's going to cost, because that's what that one in. So if you have 20 grand, or just under, sign the check, and I can get it done. Um, <laughs> that's what it would do. All new glass windows. Everything gets taken out. Paint gets blasted off. Uh, totally repainted. I do have, luckily, the original document receipts that Union Pacific, when they donated that uh, caboose, I know that it came out by rail to Melba. It was then taken off the rail in Melba, put on a truck, brought here in 1980 or something like that, I have not only the receipt signed off, but the paint colors. So I can go to Sherwin-Williams and go here, and they can literally type that in and mix it. So we've got the yellow, we've got the, you know, to repaint it. That was a big mystery on our caboose in Nampa, was the paint color tone. What was the lettering? So to fully restore this, yeah, you're looking at 15 grand probably. The biggest expense is blasting and painting. Um, to do to do the job. The interior is some of its wood, some of its steel. It's a it's a 1959 caboose. So it's the last generations of cabooses. So they're very. This one's you could say very modern caboose. It had electric lights. It had a generator. It had a, a tank for a toilet. Didn't flush on the tracks. <clears throat> Speaking about flushing on the tracks, the outhouse <laughs> here. Uh, right now, it has a small hole underneath. I don't know if it was used as an outhouse at the location, but it w it's got a back shed. On the other side, there's a door, there's a shed. These two, uh, this room here is the outhouse. It's a two-holer, so you can sit, hold hands. Um, <laughs> back side here is the storage unit. We've cleaned it out. We found a bunch of milk crates back there, which I've got to go through because I don't think there was a big dairy in Hawaii County. For one, what the names that are branded on the side. One actually says Cherry Lane Carry. <laughs> so I'm going to see if Meridian Historical said would like to have that one because we don't have any connection to Cherry Lane Dairy or Meridian here in Murphy or Hawaii County. So we got a lot of milk crates in there. But possible, well, we got to put a new roof on it, just get some shingles and put some a better roof on it, keep it leaking. But it's right on the edge. That's it. That's the edge. There's a wall now being built around it. But possibly move the, if it's it won't fall over, move the shed, move the outhouse to the schoolyard, put it in there, and set it up and restore it and still use it as a shed, but also, here's the outhouse, kids, and get it away from the edge here, and that would open up this back here by the depot some more, but that's, I don't even know if it's structurally and how we're going to move it and all that, but that was just an idea that's come up in the last couple of weeks, possibly moving of the shed. <laughs> That's why it says TBD, to be determined. These uh, order board, semaphore signal, train order board, that was going with your train <laughs> depot. Normally, train depots would have, a small depot would have one that told the train to stop, grab your order. The mechanism works. I was able to move 
with a hydraulic jack to get this down and up. This is in the red posi This is in the um, red stop. Down would be clear. It's a great piece of railroad history. Uh, to fully restore it um, might be difficult. The reason it's on the list is because issue of falling over and another gust of wind. I don't know when it's going to happen. It's going to be a matter of time. It may be five years in the future before it falls, but it's going to fall. It's going to destroy this, which is priceless, this mechanism. Well, the spectacle unit, the glass, the lantern that's up there. When it falls over, it's gone. And why is it going to fall over? Well, because the base has a severe crack mm -hmm. in it, multiple severe cracks. And to take this out, crane lift it, lay it out, restore it, you, finding a new base may be difficult. Then you got to put it in, and they used lead, right? It was lead, yeah. lead, and some other material. Yeah, they used sulfur on that. Sulfur, and sulfur that's why the water got hit and they cracked it. Sulfur leaked the water in, severe crack on winter. That was it, casting crack. You can't fix it. One day it's going to fall over, it's going to snap, and we're going to lose the whole thing and lose something else with it. Either the depot or the annex or... I, the Idaho Heritage Trust lady doesn't like to see things altered or changed, but in this case, what we would do is we would take it down, we would cut the pole up by the spectacle unit, so maybe keep 10 feet on the pole, I don't know, five, eight feet, mm. and the upper unit would be then totally restored, the lamp would be turned on, and we would put it against a wall or in the annex. So you'd always have it, and it'd be Beautiful, because those, those flags are porcelain. Fully restore it, put it up in the annex, display it, light it. You can, it'll be a move, demonstration. Yes, we're going to lose the entire pole and ladder and all of that, but we're going to have, you know, it'll be taller than me, the spectacle, you'd be, you know, it'd be a good display. Yes, we're going to lose it, but we may lose it in four years, less than a year, who knows when, but because that's going to be a crane job mm -hmm. out of here. Lay it down on the ground and to restore, but that's an issue I've seen, and who knows, it, 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 it could have been like this for 20 years already, who knows how long that crack's been there, but to Eric, me, I don't want to lose the spectacle unit up there, so, Eric, or the depot. Because that's in Owyhee County, could you take that base and wrap it with baling wire and just keep wrapping it around? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. My luck is it's going to fall in the depot after I did the restoration. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that, that's a safety issue, because my, or, or my, our luck is it's going to fall at outpost days. It's going to fall, you know, who knows? But it's one of those issues where I'm watching it. It's there, so. Um, the depot is the next item on the list. Exterior-wise, the plan is a full top-down, inside-outside restoration of the Marcy Depot, which turns 100 in 2022. It would be great to have it completed in 20, before 20, or add in 2022, so this will be grants from Idaho Heritage Trust. This is going to be grants from other donations. A new roof, new windows, which the window guy, I'm going to start having him look at windows on that. All new windows, all new roof, all new paint, um, all new wiring if need be inside, hooking up the wiring correctly. Originally the power came in here and then in through the fuse panel and then lit up the depot. Right now we have it wired in backwards uh, in the line because that's where our power comes in right here to a fuse panel that, de that the museum put in later afterwards. The mining equipment here needs to be moved away when we start the restoration project, where we're going to put it, possibly the schoolhouse, tool yard area for now. Um, overall, the eaves, all of this stuff, look, excuse me, looks in good condition. This here, there's black and white photos of this depot as a two-tone color. What the two-tone color was is a good question. Possibly dark green, the window frames are green. This could have been green and white. I got to do more research on what UP would have designed depots back then on what color. Definitely was not all white, so isn't we'll be there, taking it back to. Isn't there anybody around that would remember? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. No, know. they're gonna remember it white if anything. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Well, just a real quick question back to the semaphore. Mm. Mm. Is does the county have oh, like a uh, like a line truck or a crane? The other thing is uh, maybe approach Idaho Power to bring a line truck out and just. 
yank that whole thing down and lay it down. <laughs> Someone's got to donate a crane. It'd be great donating a crane, you know, the service of a crane. Yeah. At this point, I don't know what the county has. I don't know. I know power, but it's not, see, it's not a power issue thing. No, it's not a power issue. It's just a community thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. This is all things to, yeah. This is why I'm presenting all this to you guys so that you guys can think about it and go, I know something. I can help or whatever. Take this and spread it in the community. More exterior shots. That sign's going to come down and replace an authentic de um, Union Pacific Railroad Depot sign. I've got a book on the exact dimensions of the letters of the sign, everything. But what it's actually supposed to say, Marcy, uh, elevation on it too. So that's missing. And that firebox is an original firebox where the fire extinguisher would have been. And there's even inscriptions on there, the men who serviced them back in the day. It's still written in there. There's one identical to this at the Boise Depot in the Bell Tower. And it dates back to the time when it was built as well. So, And I've got drawing plans on that if I had to rebuild that, which I don't have to. But So a full restoration on the outside. The inside as well, all that green has to come out. Totally clean it out. That green was painted like the cabooses. The UP came in with an air gun and went like this, sprayed it. <laughs> they didn't care. We're thinking the original colors are here and here and here where things were removed from the wall. We would find the original colors. This is your tick, uh, waiting room, light bulb, which is working now. See, the lights all work. It's just we got to wire them correctly. And uh, this was a ticket office and then door into baggage room. There's that oil furnace. It looks in really good shape. It may work. The motor fan blower is gummed up. Probably needs to be cleaned up. Probably will work. Possibly could get it working. Maybe we could use it in here. Maybe we don't want to use it. At least it's in really good shape. But total restoration inside. You know, sink would be installed back. Pump plumbing would be put down on the floor, but not actually have water running through it. But it's all that way when you walk in that depot. You're walking into 1922, 25, whatever, 30 in Marsing, and you're going to buy your ticket. There will be display panels in here, and, and it'll be ready to go for a train that day. The baggage room will also be, well, it's already cleaned up. There is the original lights that were in it. It provides really good lighting. We're, we're going to use it for storage continually. Um, I'd like to build a shelf along one of the walls here, uh, attached for stacking of wood. We have a lot of wood laying around here in piles and tarp it so no one sees it. But so that way when the tourist comes in, there's a chain across this door to look in and see the baggage room. But also, there's the outpost today's chairs and tables and, and extra stuff. That's still a storage unit, but not as it was. And the windows all need new glass. There's glass missing. They're cracked. They're it's, it's total restoration. So this is going to be a big project uh, to itself. Next building is our stamp mill. Before outpost days, we'd like to bury the extension cord power cable from power pole to building, streamline the power boxes on that exterior power pole, and evaluate, uh, which is 2020, evaluate and to be determined when we need to restay in the building to keep it from going bad. So we're going to. Um, um, so that's, that's the front side. There's the back side. It's going to need new stain. The sprinklers are hitting it, unfortunately, on the bottom here. And there's that power panel. That needs to be cleaned up. There's multiple panels. One power panel is dead. It, it could go. There's black, two black <coughs> cables running down into the lawn, on the top of the lawn, into the building. That was a temporary hookup by one of our the one, Deb's electrician came in, volunteered the time, installed it, got the power and the lights working. He hasn't come back to finish digging the trench, installing it correctly. So that would be nice to have come back and have him volunteer again to do that. And then he said he would streamline what's on that pole. Why there's all these meters is because right next to, behind the photo, behind me in the photo, would have been an old mobile home trailer that Tom Couch used to live in on the complex. When they yanked that all out, they cut the wires, they just left it all there. So we're left with, we don't know what's what there. So that needs to be cleaned up and streamlined. So that, and that power panel also provides power to the depot, to the stamp mill right now. So um, all that needs to be taken care of. That inside, the light bulbs in there, are up in the rafters are all incandescent. When they burn out, we'll replace them with LED. Um, 
displays in there need to be redone. They, let's see, main room, I put, eva um, well, there's a bird issue. We're going to evaluate the eaves right away. I'll create new weatherproof <coughs> interpretive panels. So these would not be anything in paper print. This would all be high quality, durable exterior, full weather panels, something that you would find on the side of a road that doesn't fade. It's, it's like a hard plastic material. Um, and that would be in here because it's, this definitely is not climate controlled and nor does it probably ever need to be. So we do need to have something that's going to hold up. This has held up quite well, but it's starting to fall apart, it's starting to fade. So um, as we continue to open the complex more to people, it would be nice to have new displays. And that is in the, you know, um, 2021. It's not a high priority on my list is to do new panels in there. But eventually, we'll have new panels and new history in there. I mean, yeah, you. Can, I mean, right now, I could redo that paperwork. It's all handwritten. The cards are curling. You know, we could at least redo that, and that's easy. We can print that here on the printer, type it up. But you know, update, clean, make it look sharp. Moving on to the main museum here. Um, the first thing is evaluate the wood. Uh, all that wood out exterior needs to be stained again, possibly, as it's going to start to appeal and get icky. So we're going to at least evaluate what our time frame is, what we've got left this year. Evaluate, um, yeah, you can see it's starting to fade on that side too. And that, and we can do all this work here. We can get volunteers, we can donate all that stain and do all that, but things to think about on that. Also, possibly extending that false facade, which is a big, to, uh, big to be announced, to determine 2022, is take that facade and just go all the way to the end here and cover that other green building and no one will ever know it was there. You know, it'll all look the same from the front, but that is really just a, uh, an appearance thing, not a mandatory thing. Uh, we would still keep the electrical outlets there, but everything would be the same, matching one day. That was, you know, um, moving inside the lobby and gift shop and all of these lights here. Phase two of the project, which I'm working with the state of Idaho on right now, for the upgrade of lighting in Museum Room 1, that um, the state is paying for that because it's an energy upgrade. So out of 5,600, we're only paying 600. They're paying 5000 of it. She, the lady, I'm, well, I know I'm boring, but, yeah, damn. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all of these lights here, um, this is phase two. The fixtures stay in, but all the bulbs in this area, into the archive, become LED. And they're all the same color, all energy efficient, and they'll pay for that too, because it's energy upgrading. But it'll still look like this when we're done. You won't notice a difference, but everything will be the same color and they won't be burning out, hopefully. Into the saloon here, we have um, saloon. Got to evaluate the ceiling and remove, possibly repair, replace uh, with pattern tin paneling on the ceiling up here. This job was done. I don't know what this is sticking out of the wall. This light doesn't turn on. I don't know if it's burned out, if we're missing a switch somewhere. Um, it's ugly. This is a saloon. Let's turn it into a saloon then. I'd like to put in a tin roof drop, ce uh, tin ceiling, copper. You know, it's plastic these days. Maybe some wall sconces in here. Wire them in like these, but western more. Uh, the floor would be nice to finish in there like this. Uh, we may have some scraps laying around so we have a mix-match pattern floor. Uh, we do use it as storage, which we, I'd like to move some of the stuff out into our storage, exterior storage, right outside this door, which we've just cleaned out, and have this still for chairs and tables. But when we have events, it'll look more presentable. And since it says outpost saloon, might as well make it look like a saloon feel. So evaluate this ceiling, either remove it or, re or fix it or cover it, and get rid of the fluorescent lights. Possibly put in a ceiling fan. If the air moving in our outpost days, it would be very needed a nice ceiling fan to keep the guy, the bartender, cooler. So, <laughs> other than that, that's that's another job, another another floor to ceiling job is a saloon. 
and that's all 2020, 2021, when we can get to it. Uh, the saloon. Archive and library is currently happening. Actually, these are photos we just took. We moved two shelves, two shelves out to the storage and covered them. We didn't even need them in the library once we cleaned out some of the books we had in there, in magazines we had in there. Um, same with the archive. We got rid of a huge desk in here, a huge table in here. If we need a table, we could flip a table out. Not a big deal. These, these, um, Shelves here are really professional quality. Other museums use them in archiving rooms. You can get them on Amazon. Donation of money. This is where you donate, hey, here's the hundred bucks. I would like it to go to shelving. Great, I'll go order them today. And that's the plan is to put more shelves in here and get this. Look at all, these are maps. Some of these are probably historic maps rolled up in a box, just thrown in there. We need to have them displayed on a shelf properly in a proper map storage. So there's a lot to do in here. This is going to be a year and, and a half to archive, get this all put up. The other bonus of getting a wall in the lobby area, the annex right away, all of these tiles that are taking up space in here that you guys put your names on and donated for the annex are not up yet. People keep asking, when's my tile going up? I said, well, as soon as we get a wall put in. Because I don't want to put them out there and get them destroyed or put them on the floor. Amy's thought was, we'll put them on the floor and then we'll seal them under the floor. Like, yeah, but what if people are walking on that? It's a tile floor and I'd like them to split on the wall and we need a wall. So that'll get some stuff out of the archive when we get a wall built. So, and that just takes donation of money or two by fours, lumber, things like that, specific for the project. But yeah, there's tiles in here. We live at Austin. Margaret's gung ho. She's excited. She wanted to do this under Amy's, but Amy, but Amy didn't want to do that or whatever. She goes, I don't. She just listed every drawer. If you pull out, there's a steno paper pad, and it's what's in this drawer, which helps. She's excited to do what I want to do: put more shelves in there, label, organize. Library is a library. Books, research material that should not be locked up or white glove touched. You could put in the library here. Um, plus, it's our meeting room for some meetings, so we don't want things that are really valuable in there either. So we're cleaning both of these rooms up right now and going through things. So. Moving into museum room one, as of, <clears throat> let's see here, February 14th, Valentine's Day, this coming up, a grid ceiling will be installed in here. This will be the last time you should see fluorescent lights hanging, con all this duct work. There will be a drop ceiling that runs right against that upper line all the way around. It will be a dark brown. It will look just like this, but dark brown. There will be these panels, LED flat panels, four of, four or five, maybe six, down, 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 and around. So when you're working on Monday cleaning house, you turn those on. Do not turn on. We'll have a U-shaped track that will run all the way around this room and will spotlight, hard spotlight, your display. So when you walk in, Actually, it's really great. You turn these off. These lights here spotlight that. Great. <clears throat> we have displays over here, the sheriff display, that are lit already. You walk in, boom, your eye goes here. Boom, your eye will go here. This cabinet's already lit up. Another track light will hit these displays here. You can see the light right there on that one. It'll look so much better, and you won't have the annoying hum of fluorescent fixtures. And this ceiling will keep all the heat and air down here. Because right now, all that heat and air is going all the way back there, all the way back in here, all up in, up, up in there. So <clears throat> the museum will finally be sealed down in here, and professional lighting in all three rooms will look really sharp when you walk in. So that's ordered. It's on, it's on the docket. They're going to come install. Uh, for a couple of weeks, we won't have any of these lights. They'll be taken down. Town and Country will come in, take down, install, and it'll all be seamless. All we got to do is pay the bill. Isn't that nice? Yeah. <clears throat> Coming around the room, this is where the sheep herders wagon was, big hole like you know in the museum. Uh, <clears throat> vendor location for our bazaars right now. But this is where our new rotating display area will be. And we would like, I'm gonna reach out starting this year, is Marsing, Homedale, or all Homedale, or all Marsing, Bruno, Grandview, or whatever. Each year it's gonna be a town, and I like the town to sponsor the project. 
The display case, maybe I, I need to purchase a new display case. That's $585 for one case that looks really sharp. So maybe the town wants to flip some money. Not only does the town want to flip money, but maybe they'd like to give. <clears throat> I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to sit here and design a whole display and go, here you go, Marcin, come check it out. Because they have no connection into it. And Mary O'Malley is already totally on board. She's actually the one that suggested that. I'm like, ass, way ahead of you. Because then they feel vested. They <coughs> put something into it. They, maybe they have things we don't have. We have photos. We don't have a lot of artifacts sometimes from the town. Like Grandview or Bruno, the E-Museum has Letterman jackets. We have nothing. So they have it on display, and good luck getting a loan from them. Yeah. It's theirs. Trust me, I already went there, and I looked around and talked really nice to them. <laughs> but it's theirs, and it's, it's fine. They can have it. But So I'm going to hit, hit, hit these towns. Maybe split the display. Like I said, Marcy, Homedale. Then next year, Bruno Grandview. Oriana, you try to hit these towns, and then that makes it rotating and also a dedicated location. Because the commissioners already told me they'd like to see more than silver, silver, silver. <laughs> it's all about Silver City. Yeah, so we have people in Homedale, on the far side of the county, and Grandview, and Reynolds Creek, and we, we should feature them. We are the whole county. So this will be our new location for that. <clears throat> Museum Room 2 is pretty much. Done, lighting's done. We're not going to put a drop ceiling in here due to the lighting and the way it's designed. It's fine as it is. Um, this area is our kitchen, our piano here. This kind of changes throughout the season. The print shop is good to go there. Maybe better signage. The lighting is good. We just installed um, bright LED floodlights, so we don't have to use these anymore. During work days, we can now switch over to the fluorescents um, in there or LED lamps in there. This, uh, uh, room three, this is all gone at this point. It's all taken down. All of the panels in here will be remade, totally redone, so we will not be putting them back out. <clears throat> the history will be then reinterpreted into a professional, like if you've seen the, silver, the Swan Falls power display, those tilt back panels, all printed on one panel, foam core possibly. And right now, if you go back there, this whole wall is blank. We covered the steel beam with a wall, because no one ever did. Sealed that up, sealed this crack. They put two walls together, never plastered it, so there was always a crack there. <laughs> this is all going to be a mural. There's going to be a mountain line here. The mount this is War Eagle right here. It'll come down. You're going to have Silver City painted on here. There'll be an interpretive panel here talking about silver. There'll be one here talking about the church, the schoolhouse, the hotel and it'll all be painted like you're standing on a hill looking over the entire valley, the town, the mountain, and then you turn your attention to another display panel all about Dewey, and it's painted Dewey in the mountains here, and then Delamar painted the hotel, and the big trade dollar mine painted on the mountain, and then we'll have a display case right here. It would be nice to have a brand new one, nice shiny one, instead of these old ones. Nothing wrong, but, you know, uh, with artifacts, with the china, with very limited artifacts of Silver City, because most of it went to E-Museum. But this will be a permanent Silver City display, because it's going to be painted on the wall. So this will always be up. So this, before outpost days, it will be completely done and up. So when you walk into room three, the mine tunnel, I don't look at you. No, I don't. Um, the mine tunnel, you have the Dewey Ore Cabinet, you got the mine tunnel, ore cabinet, Silver City, Dewey, Delamar, the power line, how electricity was brought to the mine town, the Chinese display of Chinese in silver. There's another cabinet that's empty. Next week or so, um, Integra Mining is coming in. They're paying and building a display in there that helps talk about mining and what we get from it and how we do it. And so that whole room will kind of, and there's an ore cart in the middle of the room, so that whole room is going to be now our mining room, our local mountain history room, Delamar, Dewey, Silver City. The mine tunnel is pretty permanent display, so that's that we turn kind of turn that into the mine exhibit room. Uh, and the last thing is the back door out of the museum, which is in that room. Double doors out. These double doors need to be refinished. That plaster job needs to be all cleaned up. These doors need to be able to close without slamming them, or putting your weight into them to open them. Uh, during outpost days, you all walk through here, probably this was our thoroughfare, that's, those doors will lead out of that asphalt walkway, out to the annex. 
That door is our archiving room. It's been turned in. That's where Sherry, our archivist, works. Our computer's in there, a table with a camera. Your, your artifact you bring in, it all goes in there. It's where it gets a session. Then it gets put in the vault. The other half of the room, you got a curtain up now. That's some more storage area for us, some things that are still stored away in there. But it's been cleaned up. When I got here a year ago, you couldn't walk in there. You couldn't close the door. You, it was fully the brim stuffed of stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff, yeah. So that's, um, that's the last thing on the museum would be to fix the door, fix the plaster, make it look good, because that's going to be our back door. It's the museum eventually here. So... And that, finish the, t oh, finish the mine tunnel, there's little things, mine tunnel, I'd like to finish the top of the tunnel, make it look like a mountainside coming down, uh, finish the interior walls, back room as I mentioned, uh, the entire building, duct cleaning, these ducts in this building probably have never been cleaned since 2004 when this was built, so I'm sure they're very, very bad, so I've already got a lead on this spring to get them blown out and cleaned. Um, each room, well, the spring cleaning, we plan to clean each room top to bottom. And uh, exhibit rooms will be cleaned and, and on the floor will be polished as well. So I think, I think that wraps it up. That covers <laughs> the entire museum complex. That's our goal. Will it all happen this year? Probably not. A lot of it's evaluations. As you can see, just evaluate. Does not mean we're going to work on it. Just look at it and go, yeah, we need to do that. <laughs> And then go back in and, and not think about it. But um, that's where we're at at this point on each building.